Hello everyone, my name is Emily Louie and on behalf of Campbell and Company, I would like to welcome you to Using Data Visualization Best Practices to Connect with Donors. Thank you for joining us. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to quickly go through some logistics for those of you who may be new to our webinars. First, please close any programs other than GoToWebinar that are running on your computer. Next, we recommend calling in with a telephone instead of using your computer speakers. This will greatly improve your audio experience. Lastly, if you experience visual issues, please send a chat to Campbell and Company or contact GoToWebinar at the number on your screen. Today's webinar will last 60 minutes and you'll earn one continuing education credit that is good with your participation with CFRE International. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive an email from GoToWebinar that includes information on how to download your certificate. We won't, be, we won't be sharing slides from today's presentation, but we will be sending a link to the recording in the follow-up email from GoToWebinar. We do welcome questions throughout the webinar. Please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel that should be on the right side of your computer screen. We will also hold time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Taylor Schmidt, Strategic Information Services Consultant, and Molly Sachs, Senior Marketing Associate and Online Fundraising Consultant. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor Schmidt. I'm a consultant in our Strategic Information Services Division here at Campbell & Company. I work with large and complex data sets on a daily basis, and I'm often charged with communicating key insights to stakeholders, including both my colleagues and clients. I'm passionate about choosing and creating impactful data visualizations. I believe in the power of Excel to create data viz even better than the default charts, and have also been exploring additional resources to continue to improve our visuals. And I'm Molly Sachs. I'm a senior marketing associate and an online fundraising consultant at Campbell & Company. In my work, I'm often confronted with how to effectively share research findings and other data with a wide audience. I first started getting interested in data visualization in a data analysis class during graduate school, where I learned that those default Excel graphs aren't always the best way to display information. I firmly believe that data visualization best practices can help you better communicate and connect with your closest supporters. Before we dive in, I'm going to give you a snapshot of what we'll be covering today. First, we'll explore what data visualization is and why fundraisers should care. Next, we'll look at how to create truthful and easy to interpret data visualizations using principles from Edward Tufte, a pioneer in the data visualization field. From there, we'll walk through several instances when a data visualization can help you better communicate with your supporters, and we'll explain how you can pick the right visualization out of the multitude of options at your fingertips. We'll then build on Tufti's principles, sharing a set of simple guidelines for creating visualizations. At that point, Taylor and I will open it up for your questions. We want to make sure this webinar is tailored to your needs, so we saved a significant chunk of time to answer your questions and address challenges you're facing. So please send those questions in. Finally, data visualization is best learned through examples, so we've peppered the many throughout this webinar. We'll close out the session with a few more examples to reinforce concepts. So let's get started. The title of today's presentation is Using Data Visualization Best Practices to Connect with Donors. So what is data visualization? To answer this question, we need to start with another question, and that is, what is data? The definition that we've chosen to use today is the following. Data is a set of values of qualitative and or quantitative variables used for reference, analysis, or discussion. In other words, data is information. Using this definition of data, we can then define data visualization as any effort to help people understand the significance of data by placing it in a visual context. Let's turn to some examples. All of these here on the slide are examples of data visualization. From a fundraising thermometer to a word cloud to Google Maps, all of these take data and put it into a visual context in order to aid our understanding of the underlying information. But why should we care about data visualization? Why not simply put that underlying data front and center? We'll illustrate with some examples. Justin Matejka and George Fitzmaurice published the Data Source Dozen Datasets in 2017. 
The underlying data is many rows of metrics divided into different data sets. Here we show a few we show a table of a few statistical measures from three of those data source dozen data sets. Looking just at the measures in the table, it seems that the three data sets are the same. However, that's not actually the case. Enter data visualization. With an appropriate data visualization, we can easily see that these three data sets are quite different. Let's turn to another example. Say you want to look at the differences in money raised by program area over three years. We'll choose five categories and represent them with different colors. The legend can be seen at the right. First, we chose pie charts as our data visualization. Looking at these pie charts, it seems that the distribution between programs stayed consistent from 2016 to 2018. However, when we change this to a more appropriate visualization, bar charts, we can see that the distribution actually looks quite different in each year. For example, in 2016, the largest proportion of fundraising dollars came from the membership program, while in 2018, the largest proportion came from annual giving. The difference in interpretation comes from our brains, which can interpret differences in length much easier than differences in area, particularly when those differences aren't too large. So why should fundraisers and other development professionals care about data visualization? Firstly, everyone is asking for it, our boards, our donors, and our communities. We know this is probably one of the reasons you're spending your time with us today. Data has reached buzzword level status. It's certainly one of the most common requests we hear from volunteers and donors when we work with organizations to clarify their cases for support. While sometimes these requests are impossible to meet, we found that organizations have much more raw data to work with than they might think. And this data can help activate your case. You can write that compelling mission, vision, or story that tugs at the heartstrings, but generally numbers are needed to open the wallet. I think of data as the engine for your case. You created your vehicle, you've illustrated the path before you, and now you need to show what it will take to get there and what kind of horsepower you're working with. More and more, we see that donors need us to demonstrate the impact of their donations, and data can help do just that. Finally, that great and hard-worn one data is going to waste without effective visualization. I'd like to zone in to point to from the previous slide that data can help activate your case. Charity Water's mission is to bring safe and clean drinking water to people in developing countries. They use a fantastic data point that activates their case for support, that 663 million people in the world live without clean water. That's nearly 1 in 10 people worldwide, or twice the population of the United States. Here, we chose a data visualization to help illustrate that point. However, this pie chart really isn't effective in communicating the underlying point that we want to make. Instead, it communicates that nearly 10% of the world's population lives without clean water as a proportion. Showing it as a proportion, as we do in this pie chart, may lead the interpreter to see that proportion as small, which is not the case that we're trying to make. So let's change up the visualization. Here, we've created a data visualization that reinforces the point that twice the population of the United States lives without clean water. Now, the visualization supports the magnitude of the number of people without clean water rather than the proportion, making an impact on the interpreter and reinforcing Cherry Water's, Charity Water's powerful case. Now that we have a clear understanding of what data visualization is and why it matters for fundraisers, we're going to explore how to create truthful and easy to interpret data visualizations. Edward Tufte is a statistician, artist, and professor emeritus of political science, statistics, and computer science at Yale. He wrote, designed, and self-published four books on data visualization that have become classics in the field. And his six principles of graphic integrity are a great place to get started with data visualization best practices. Number one, the representation of numbers as physically measured on the surface of the graph itself should be directly proportional to the numerical quantities represented. 
Essentially, graphs should use accurate proportions. Number two, use clear, detailed labeling to minimize ambiguity. It helps to write out explanations of the data on the graph itself and label important events. Just make sure not to clutter your visualization with too many notes. Number three, show data, data variation, not design variation. Substance over style is key in data visualizations. We'll go into this principle a bit more later on. Number four, in time series displays of money, use inflation adjusted units of monetary measurement rather than nominal units. Using inflation adjusted dollar amounts ensures that you're comparing apples to apples over time. Number five, the number of dimensions represented should be the same as the number of dimensions in the data. This means no 3D bar graphs when you're only comparing two variables. And finally, number six, graphics must not quote data out of context. Don't cherry pick or lemon drop, which means selectively choosing items or removing unwanted data points to fit your purpose. Let's take a look at principle number six, graphics must not quote data out of context in action. Learn University is building support for a new career center, so its development team surveyed donors to gauge their knowledge and attitudes towards the project. Now the team is presenting some of the survey findings. They include this visual and explanation and a report for leadership and trustees. In surveying its donors, Learn University found that 47% of respondents knew that Learn U offers free resume review for current students at the Career Center. This result seems really striking and somewhat troubling for a university looking to fundraise for a new Career Center. Most of its donors don't even know about one of the center's core offerings. But this visualization was quoting data out of context, so let's take a look at the full picture. When we add additional context to the data, we find that this knowledge is truly driven by alumni donors, 80% of whom know about the free resume review. LearnU does have some work to do in educating non-alumni donors on its career programs, but most of its alumni are already informed. So the bottom line, quoting data out of context in a visualization can mislead viewers and cause them to draw inaccurate conclusions. Now let's use that same example and see how principles one and five come into play. Principle one states that the representation of numbers as physically measured on the surface of the graph itself should be directly proportional to the numerical quantities represented. Accurate proportions are key. In our graph, alumni represent 80% and non-alumni represent 20%. That means the alumni bar should be four times the size of the non-alumni bar. Let's see how our graph stacks up. The bars are proportional to the percentages they're representing, and this is important because, you guessed it, it makes the graph easier to interpret and less likely to present a misleading picture to your viewers. Next, let's see how principle five works in this example. As a refresher, principle five states that the number of dimensions represented should be the same as the number of dimensions in the data. So this means that you shouldn't use a 3D graph if you only have two variables. I changed our graph from the last example to have three dimensions. These types of 3D graphs were pretty popular in the 90s and the aughts, but you still see them from time to time. In this example, we have two variables, type of donor, alumni or non-alumni, and percent of knowledge about resume review at the Career Center. Those variables can be displayed on a 2D graph with an X and Y axis, as we saw on the last slide. That third dimension just isn't serving any purpose. It's not helping our viewers interpret the graph, and worse, it's making the interpretation process harder. When you put the two versions side by side, the difference is even starker. That third dimension is unnecessarily distracting. We're making our viewer work harder to process the same information. As is so often the case when it comes to data visualizations, less is more. So when do you need a data visualization? And how do you go about picking the right one? I'm going to walk through three situations where a well-placed data visualization can help you activate your case and connect with supporters. I'll use examples to help clarify each situation. A data visualization can help illustrate the opportunities and challenges before you, need, projected impact, and impact. When our communications team was working with Sinai Health System several years ago, they were finding it difficult to convey the scope of Sinai service area, which covers a large portion of Chicago and the surrounding region. This visualization was their answer. It's a simple way of showing how vast that service area is. Overlaying the Chicago transit lines helped to further orient viewers who are used to visualizing the city in those terms. 
the resulting visualization communicates a vast opportunity as well as a vast challenge. A data visualization can also help you communicate quickly, clearly, and with specificity. IGNITE is building a national movement of women who are ready and eager to become the next generation of political leaders, a very long game mission. In the organization's 2017 to 2018 annual report, Simple Donut Charts helped IGNITE quickly share concrete progress toward that mission with their donors and community members. 37% of IGNITE women ran for office on their campus, and 79% of those who ran won. Finally, a data visualization can help you show, not tell, across donor communications, in annual reports, on your website, in emails and letters, on social media, and beyond. Skills USA improves the quality of our nation's work, of our nation's future skilled workforce through the development of framework skills that include personal, workplace, and technical skills grounded in academics. This Skills USA visualization drives home a powerful point. The traditional high school to college career path only works well for a fraction of high school students. By coupling text with a data visualization, the progression is easier to follow and ultimately more compelling. By now we've seen when data visualizations can be useful in fundraising, so I'm going to pass it to Taylor to discuss how to choose the right visualization. There are many ways to go about choosing a data visualization, particularly when choosing charts and tables. We use the logic you see here, which is adapted from Dr. Andrew Avila's extreme presentation method. He splits data visualizations into four categories, comparison, distribution, composition, and relationship. Comparison is used to compare one or more data sets. They can compare items or show differences over time. Distribution is used to show how variables are distributed over time, which helps us identify outliers as well as trends. The composition category is used to display parts of a whole and, change over, and that change over time. The relationship category is used to show a connection or a correlation between two or more variables. Once you've chosen the category that's appropriate for your data, you can move on to the chart chooser, also adapted from the extreme presentation method. There are many options here, from the simple line graphs to the more complicated, stacked column charts with subcomponents. Following this chart is a way to help choose an appropriate visual. Start in the middle, choosing which category of visualization is appropriate for the data that you have to show. Then, follow the branches to choose a chart. This will be sent out as part of our follow-up materials for you to have and to use, and we will use it as an example later on in today's presentation. I even have a copy of this hanging on my cubicle wall for easy access in choosing a visual. In addition to choosing an appropriate data visualization, there are many guidelines for how to tactically make your data visualization spectacular. Dr. Edward Tufte believes that data visualization should do whatever it takes to explain something. Molly and I agree, and we also know that having guidelines in how to do this are helpful. Stephanie Evergreen and Ann K. Emery published a data visualization checklist that we love to use. We pulled out a few of the core guidelines that we use whenever we create data visualizations. Firstly, order data in an intentional way. Some examples might be from smallest to largest, by time period or year, and alphabetically. Two, don't add decoration. Unless it aids in the interpretation of the visualization, we recommend not including it. Otherwise, it can be confusing to the viewer. Thirdly, use color to highlight key patterns. Use color to draw the viewer's eye to key pieces of the visualization, and use muted colors, such as grays, for the less important pieces. Next, label your data directly. Legends force your eyes to move back and forth between a graph or chart and its labels, making it more difficult to interpret the graph. Positioning data labels near the data, whether that's on top of or next to bars or next to lines, allows you to interpret without the interruption of your eye needing to go back and forth. Next, 
remove access tick marks and lines when they don't contribute to interpretation. Similarly to Core Guideline 2, this will make your visuals both easier to interpret as well as look sleeker. Next, I'm going to take those five guidelines that Taylor just shared and put them to work in a fictional example. You work for an environmental organization that is building philanthropic support for more green space in Here City. Your team wants to demonstrate that need by comparing parked acres in Here City to other cities in the region. You have this table, which I want to point out is itself a data visualization, but you think another type of visualization might drive home your point more effectively. Let's take another look at the choosing the right data visualization chart. In this case, you want to compare park acres in Here City to other cities in the region, so you'll be choosing from the comparison section. You are comparing among items, not over time, and you have many items, in this case cities, so you'll use a bar chart. You might start with something that looks like this. It's showing all the data correctly, and you even added a bit of nature-related pizzazz on each bar. But you need to step back and ask yourself, is that pizzazz really contributing anything to the interpretation of the graph? If you ask a friend, they might tell you that your mountain icons are distracting. You need to follow the guideline, don't add decoration, and keep it simple. Next, let's talk about labeling data directly. Excel gave you this convenient legend on the right side of your graph, and you think you're good to go. But take a moment to try to interpret the graph. Is it easier to find placelands bar with the legend or with the bars labeled directly? You ask yourself a similar question about the numerical values of each bar. Can you tell how many park acres any town has per 100,000 residents? It looks like a bit under 4,500, right? When you add data labels to each bar, you don't have to guess that acreage. You have the benefit of both the visualization and the exact number. And since each bar is labeled with an exact numerical value, you no longer need the x-axis taking up real estate and drawing your viewer's attention to the bottom of the graph. At this point, your graph is already so much easier to interpret than when you started, but you're still not making the strongest case for more green space in your city. Right now, your bars are ordered randomly. What if you ordered them from least acres per 100,000 residents to most acres? By ordering your data in an intentional way, you can really see the disparity between here cities, park acres, and the other five cities. You choose to order it least to most so that here city is at the top since it's your main focus. What else can you do to make your city stand out and drive home the need for more green space there? At present, you're using a palette of greens and blues that you think works well for your environmental focus cause. What do those colors really mean? Again, you're using them as decoration rather than to highlight key patterns. Instead, you decide to use color as a tool for interpretation. Now, here city is the only bar in color. The rest are in a muted gray. This causes your viewer's eye to go straight to here city, your focus. Just one more core guideline to implement. Your graph makes a powerful impression and demonstrates the need for more green space. But you notice that the vertical lines are unnecessary now that your x-axis is gone and your bars are directly labeled. They're just not contributing to interpretation, so you remove them. And voila, you did whatever it took to explain the information, and you ended up with this graph. It's simple, clean, and persuasive to your donor base. Now that we have a better feel for how those core guidelines work, I'm going to share some additional guidelines from Stephanie Evergreen and Ann K. Emery's checklist. Use a short descriptive title that's left justified in the upper left corner. Aim for 6 to 12 words. Short titles make comprehension easier while skimming, and descriptive titles help the viewer quickly draw a conclusion. Since we read starting at the top of a document left to right, the title should go in the upper left corner. Use horizontal text. Horizontal text is easier to read than vertical and diagonal text. This applies to subtitles, titles, and data labels. Access labels can be vertical if needed. Ensure that text is hierarchical and readable. To emphasize importance, titles should be in the largest font size, followed by subtitles, annotations, labels, access labels, and source information. Your smallest text should be 9-point font on paper and 20 on screen to ensure readability. Text should sufficiently contrast its background. Dark text on a white background is best. Without enough contrast, your visualization will just be hard to read. 
Don't use red and green to show contrast. Instead, use red and blue. Add yellow and black if necessary. Red-green colorblindness is the most common form of colorblindness, so it's best to steer clear of this combo. Graphs should not have borderlines. The borderline is distracting and does not add any meaning to the graph itself. Graphs should look like they bleed into the surrounding page. All graphs should have one x-axis and one y-axis. Don't use multiple y-axes. It's easiest for viewers to interpret one x and one y-axis. When there are two dueling y-axes, your viewers may not know which axes labels correspond to which data. Dueling y-axes may also imply correlation where there is none. I know we just went through a lot of guidelines, so we will be sending out a link to these um, with the webinar recording. At this point, we're going to take a break for audience Q&A. We have a few more examples to share with you, but we want to prioritize your questions. Emily, what questions do we have? Well, first, our first question is, are there situations where it's better not to use data visualization at all? Uh, yes. Uh, th thank you, Emily, for the question um, and for whoever sent it in. Absolutely, there are situations where it's better to not use a data visualization at all. Um, sometimes simply just writing your finding could be more powerful than a data visualization, um, maybe in a sentence. Um, for example, instead of showing a chart to divide yes and no answers from a survey, similarly to the example we looked at earlier uh, with the university and whether people knew about the free resume building at the Career Center, um, it could be more powerful to just state the percentage of respondents that answered yes in a sentence. Um, also, it's important to keep the context of your data visualizations in mind. Uh, so if you're doing a report or a presentation and nearly every section or slide of it is punctuated by a visual, uh, your readers could get tired and your visualizations may lose impact simply because there's so many of them. So make sure to use them with purpose and when the point that you're trying to drive home um, is really necessitates using a visualization uh, where the, that underlying data is too complex to just present um, yeah. or too large to present. Anything to add, Molly? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think you really have to think about it from the viewer's perspective and resist that urge that Taylor talked about to turn every data set into a graph. I think that happens a lot, but just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. And you should select the data points and the data sets that are really those the most important to the point that you're working to convey. Great, thank you. Is it best to use only one visualization per document? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I don't want to give a wishy-washy answer, but I think it really depends on the context. Um, like we just said, I think if you have, you don't want to overwhelm the viewer. You don't want to hit them with too many visualizations. Um, but I can definitely see an instance where you could comfortably put two or three visualizations in a you know one to two page um, document. Taylor, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, um, I totally agree. I also think. Um, considering using tables as your visualization is a, a great tool when you have, particularly when you have smaller or shorter documents, um, instead of using the more traditional bar or line graph for everything, um, being able to chart that out in a well-labeled table uh, counts as a data visualization as well as might be um, easier and just less overwhelming for your reader when you're looking at a single document. Yeah, definitely don't be afraid to use um, tables, especially for smaller data sets like Taylor was describing. Mm -hmm. They can be really useful. Perfect. Our next question is, should the goal of data visualization be to inform or to persuade? I love that question. Um, the the former. <laughs> it should be to inform, um, not to persuade. I think one of the points Molly brought up earlier was the idea of cherry picking and lemon dropping, which is where you know when you you pick out the cherry that you want to show, or you drop some piece of knowledge. Uh, so striking a balance between using your visuals 
to really just tell the underlying story of the data set that you have and presenting it as is in a way that your readers can come to your own conclusions can be really, really powerful. Um, and then also, if, particularly when you have more complex data sets, not being afraid to help your, help your viewer along in interpreting that. Um, so if it's something that's more complicated, using that tagline to say, like, when we created this data visualization, we saw this come out, and we thought it was interesting enough that we wanted to, to bring it up and make sure that when you look at it, you also are seeing what we're seeing. But combining that with the actual visual and allowing the viewer to see it as it is without messing with it um, is really important in keeping with the integrity of your data visualizations. Um, and that, that line can be really tricky to keep, to be informative um, and to be explanatory without moving too far into the, we're using this to persuade our already held idea. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's a really fine line, and data visualizations can be incredibly persuasive, but I think you have to use them in the way that Taylor was describing, where you're not manipulating anything, you're not violating that graphic integrity principle number six, using it out of context. Um, so you, as long as you're using it where you're presenting the full picture, I think you can absolutely persuade them, but the bottom line should be to inform them of this data point and you know, possibly to include it in a larger story that you're, you're telling to your audience. Great, thanks. Um, can you describe some instances where axes and tick marks serve to enhance the data visualization? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one that comes to mind is a line graph where you have um, in continuous data or just so many different points that you're not going to label each one. In that case, you're going to want to use a y-axis and you're going to possibly want to use tick marks as well um, so that people can see the overall slope of that line rather than um, the individual points because you're not trying to show um, four data points. You're trying to show maybe like 100. So that could be a good use for them. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great example. Um, I'm also thinking of when the numbers that you're showing are either very specific or very big. So like if you're tracking, let's say, fundraising progress and you're making you know, $20,474,342 in revenue one year and then that changes slightly the next year, having all of those digits, um, sometimes it's, it's really important for the audience to have those digits depending on who your audience is. And, and sometimes what you really are trying to inform them is just this is our general progress up and down. Here's about the number that we're at. So one way to go about that when you have that type of information is to use axes and tick marks. Um, uh, choosing the appropriate cutoff so that you can see what those differences are and, of course, starting your axis at zero. But that could be another example. And then another way to do that without using um, a lot of tick marks or axes is to directly label but just round your numbers. So in some cases, it's appropriate to not be, um, to not be well, not accurate, but to not be specific to the dollar amount. You can round it to thousands or millions uh, and still directly label that in a cleaner and more concise way that's easier on the viewer instead of all of the different digits, but it's still truthful to your underlying information. Yeah, like how much information do they need? Do they need to know that exact number? Or do they need to know the numbers at all? Do they just need to see the general trend? I think that should help you in deciding whether you want to directly label or use a, a y-axis. That's a great question. Um, in addition to impact-based data, are there data visualizations about donations or fundraising that you have found to be valuable? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, all the time. Um, I'm a big fan of fundraising dashboards in general, so creating um, an easily updatable interface where on one page you can track some of the most important metrics that come with fundraising progress. Um, so, you know, comparing 
maybe by program, are you looking at your annual fund versus major gifts or your foundations and corporations versus uh, individual giving, as well as uh, kind of the year-over-year -year progress and how that might differ from last year's distribution. Um, we're, we have an example later on that will highlight one type of fundraising dashboard that we've seen. Um, but I think with, when it comes to, to fundraising particularly, there are a lot of really powerful, um, more traditional graphs that can be used to, to track that progress and for anyone on the development team or, or donors to see how it changes over years in a line graph or um, where the distribution is coming from in an appropriate pie chart or a bar chart. Um, the, it's infinite possibilities of getting that all on one page. I think it's about deciding um, what is most important to the viewer that's viewing it and then using the right tools for the underlying data. But absolutely using those visuals to track progress in addition to those raw numbers themselves can be a very powerful tool um, for your donors and for development professionals. Yeah. And as uh, just don't be afraid to, to create um, a dense dashboard. I would say don't include things that you don't need, but humans have the ability to process a lot of information at one time. Um, so putting all of that information that you need on that one page or that one screen, as the case may be, um, your viewers will be able to interpret that as long as you're using these guidelines that we've shared today. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And then our last question is more technical. Um, how does Google Charts compare to Excel? And if you want to elaborate, it'd be great if you could share some um, programs that, uh, that are helpful for uh, data visualization. That's a great question. Um, I'll take this because I have used many a program um, in creating data visualizations. So um, they're definitely different in terms of just comparing Google versus Excel. I think. Google is constantly updating the way that they um, just their, their Excel spreadsheets, their underlying Google Sheets, and the way that their charts work. Um, but historically, what I've seen is that Google has a bit less functionality in their spreadsheets uh, than Excel does, particularly the most updated versions of Excel. Uh, Excel's canned charts may not be the most appropriate for your data. You know, when you select it all and it recommends one to you and you don't change much, you just kind of go with the default. Um, and we see that a lot and it's easy because it'll pop up with a nice pie chart and you click it and you're ready to go. Um, but Excel actually has a lot of underlying functionality for their charts that allow you to customize almost every piece of it from color to the lines to the labels um, there is a ton of functionality that we often see people just aren't aware of or don't know how to use when they're creating graphs. And everything we created today in our presentation was just used, used Excel. Um, and we use it in a lot of our work. Um, and Google can, you know, and with the basics, do many of the same things. Um, there's also more advanced data visualization software, particularly when your information becomes more and more complex, that can be helpful. Um, the big ones in the field, um, oh, why am I blanking out on the There's Tableau. Oh, my, Tableau, the thank one. you. That's the big one. Um, that's an expensive one, but I think nonprofits might be able to get a cheaper license for that one. Um, we on my team in Strategic Information Services, we use R, just like the letter. R um, to do a lot of our analysis, and it also has great functionality in coding visuals, um, which is a little bit less interfacey and, and intuitive and more um, back-end coding. Um, but there's a lot of stuff out there. Even if you just have a specific type of visualization that you want to make, there are online interfaces where you can say, you know, I want to make a heat map. And there's five different websites where for free and in an easy interface, you can pop your data in there and change the colors and look at that map in a more advanced way. Um, so there's definitely options to explore, and we continue to explore them because there's so many out there, and we certainly don't know all of them yet um, or ever because they're 
always changing. Uh, but digging into the customized functionality of both Google and Excel's graphs as, you know, as programs that many people have available to them already is a fantastic place to start, and you can do a lot with them. Uh, and then when you're ready for the next level, Tableau and its competitors um, do a lot of great work in the visualization area. Anything to add? No, I would just say listen to Taylor on this one. She is an <laughs> expert, and she, she helps our team so much um, with, with this question. So, yeah. Thanks. And that's it for questions, but thank you all for, for uh, asking them. Thank you, Taylor and Molly. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. To close out our webinar, we do have a few more data visualization examples to share with you. Some are serious, some are a little bit more fun, but they all should give us a chance to put our best practices to work. At first glance, this line graph appears to show a dramatic increase in giving to ABC nonprofits annual fund. But the y-axis is actually starting at $30,000. This is something that Taylor mentioned earlier. You always want your y-axis to start at zero. But starting it at $30,000 creates a steeper slope and the misleading impression that the annual fund has been positively booming in recent years. When we do go ahead and start that y-axis at zero, we see a clear picture of annual fund giving, incremental but steady growth. In this version, we also added a graph subtitle that spells out this main takeaway, making it even easier for the viewer to interpret it. While we want to use data visualizations to influence and sometimes to persuade, it's so important that we don't manipulate the presentation to exaggerate or mislead our stakeholders. Additionally, uh, similar to what we discussed, I believe, in one of the questions, here we decided to remove the labels on the y-axis and tick marks and instead label each of the points directly, the point itself being um, the number that was raised in the annual fund. And we did this to show that this is an option. We did this in Excel. Um, since the numbers weren't too extravagant or didn't have a lot of uh, digits, we thought that this was an easy way to do it. Uh, the axis is still accurate in terms of um, it's there underlying it. So there might not be tick marks, but the spacing is still accurate. So um, you can easily add an axis back on. But in this case, we thought what we were really trying to inform was uh, the changes over year to year and how they went up and down or stayed the same. So the number itself was less important to move your eye back and forth from the axis to the point. So we directly labeled them, and then you can easily still see those both lines in between. So this is one of my favorite examples, um, one of my favorite pie chart examples, um, because it's actually talking about pie. Uh, so here we found um, a data visualization. It was a sur based on a survey by a pie maker. Uh, the pie maker asked consumers about their three favorite pie flavors. Uh, so then once they got that survey, they organized the pies into the visual that you see here. Uh, and there's a picture for each pie flavor. But we found that there's a couple critical guidelines here that the visualization isn't following. So first and perhaps most glaringly, uh, the numbers, the percentages add up to more than 100%. And this is noted at the bottom in small print. Uh, it tells us that those survey respondents were able to choose three pies, um, but we really don't believe that a pie chart here would, is the right visualization when the underlying question allows the survey respondents to choose um, more than one answer. Because a pie chart is meant to show parts of a whole. Uh, and since there is no whole here, it shouldn't be chosen when the underlying data doesn't show parts of a whole. Secondly, a lot of this text is um, upside down and sideways and diagonal, and that just makes it a bit harder to read, um, to have to turn your head to see cherry pie there at the bottom. There's also extra decoration added with the pictures of the pie slices, which um, it makes the visualization look really flashy and, and truthfully makes me a little hungry, but it doesn't really aid in the interpretation of this. Um, you could argue that it makes it 
almost harder to decipher what the sizes of each of these pie pieces are, particularly when they're really close in size to each other, and now you have that, that additional kind of distraction with your eye. So we switched it up um, and made a different version using the same underlying data. It's not as flashy, but we think it's more accurate in terms of just using the underlying data to inform. So some of the changes that we made to aid in the reader's interpretation of the visual was one, we swapped out the pie chart. We chose a more appropriate bar chart since we're not looking at true proportions of a whole. Rather, we're looking at each flavor. We're looking at the percent of people that chose it as one of their top three favorite pies. When you put uh, the data here into bars instead of slices, the differences in magnitude are much easier to see since now we're looking at length rather than area, which we know humans are better at interpreting. We keep those direct labels of pie flavors, um, but now we make sure that they are all right side up and that nothing is upside down or sideways. We also kept the intentional order of the pies. They ordered them from uh, the highest percentage of people who chose it as one of their favorites to the lowest percentage. So we kept that, but now since we're no longer in a pie and we're in a bar, instead of going clockwise around a circle in that order, we go from top to bottom, which is easier on the eyes and easily interpretable for readers. We've also added our own title and tagline, similarly to the one that they had um, in the original visualization. It clearly explains the question asked, what are your three favorite pies, as well as gives the conclusion, which is that nearly half of survey respondents agree that apple pie is one of the best pies. Finally, we pulled an example of a dashboard for fundraising. Um, this one is from Razor's Edge NXT, which I bet some of you on the phone have. Uh, it has some preloaded reports that summarize your giving in different ways. So we pulled out just a bit uh, at the top of that to go through some of the visual aspects that are included in this CAN dashboard. So there's a few important numbers called out at the top in large fonts, which makes it really easy to see right when you look at it some summary statistics of this year's giving. So easily bold, different colors at the top, big font, the revenue, the number of gifts, the average gifts, um, and the number of past due, which luckily uh, in this case is zero right there at the top. And then the first visual below it that they choose um, is year-over-year -year performance data visualization. Uh, I like this for a lot of reasons. <laughs> Uh, we like it for visualizing fundraising, uh, particularly things like the annual funds, which can be very seasonal, uh, because it clearly compares your monthly performance this year versus last year versus the year before it. So you can really easily see um, during which months there are spikes in fundraising money raised and in which months there might be dips. So right away when I look at this, I can see December uh, and March are spikes in all of the years so far. And we know based on um, creating this visualization that that's due to the organization's underlying uh, Giving Tuesday push in December uh, and holiday push and a large fundraising event that they had in March. So happy to see both of those um, pop up in each of the years. Although we might like to see the lines directly labeled instead of using a legend, um, overall the colors, um, having the, the tick marks here again since there's so many points rather than trying to directly label them, we find this visualization insightful and easy to interpret um, and easy to refresh so that you can see this progress as we go on beyond April. All right. Well, that is all we have for you today. We want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, look out for our email with the webinar recording and other resources we referenced during the session. As always, feel free to get in touch with us if you have questions. Taylor and I love to discuss data visualization. We would happy, be happy to um, 
connect with you over email or phone, so drop us a line, please. And we also encourage you to sign up for future Campbell and Company webinars. Next up is how to craft a winning online fundraising plan on April 23rd. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.